the speaker, Mr. Speaker, the speaker is the head of the majority party. See how this feels to you. The legislative majority. <laughs> the speaker is the head of the majority party. The legislative majority should shape government. Ergo, the speaker should coordinate and direct government's course. Would you tell the president that, please? <laughs> I'm John Harwood of CNBC and the New York Times at the United States Capitol. In an unprecedented gathering, House Speaker John Boehner and his predecessors Nancy Pelosi and Dennis Hastert came together in Lexington, Kentucky on the historic campus of Transylvania University to commemorate the 200th anniversary of when the great Henry Clay became Speaker of the House in 1811. They talked about the stamp that Henry Clay placed on the job in the 19th century and the stamp that they've placed on it in the 21st. Join me for this remarkable conversation with three speakers of the House. The role of the Speaker of the House, a tribute to Henry Clay, is brought to you by White Clay, helping banks deliver more for their clients. The Henry Clay Center for Statesmanship, educating a new generation of leaders in the principles and practices of statesmanship, diplomacy, and conflict resolution. Learn more at henryclaycs.org. The Kentucky Humanities Council, whose Kentucky Chautauqua presentations are telling Kentucky's stories everywhere in the Commonwealth. Kentucky Chautauqua, the impact is dramatic. G.F. Vaughn Tobacco Company, a Kentucky tradition for 100 years. Lexington Furniture at the corner of Manowar and Palumbo in Lexington. It's so much you'll love to live with. And by Lexington Oriental Rugs, handmade elegance made affordable for everyone. Took you 12 years to become Speaker of the House. Took you 20 years. Took you 20 years. When you hear about Henry Clay becoming Speaker on the very first day, does it make you feel like kind of a loser? <laughs> a slow learner. <laughs> uh, let me just say uh, thanks to uh, the university and, and uh, the Clay Foundation uh, for, for hosting this. Uh, I'll guarantee you I know more than most people up here about Henry Clay because I know I've read at least 10 biographies uh, of Clay. And this morning when I got up, I was... Uh, getting dressed, and I'm trying to figure out, all right, what kind of tie am I going to wear today? And I pulled out this tie with thoroughbreds on it uh, because uh, Henry Clay was one of the first thoroughbred breeders in Kentucky. <laughs> Henry Clay was uh, the first what I'll call strong speaker of the house, the real leader of the house. When... Uh, when our country was founded and the Congress was put together, uh, the, the first uh, speakers over the first 20 years or so uh, came out of the English Parliament system. And they were more of a referee, uh, didn't have any real power. Uh, but Clay was the first uh, real speaker of the House that had some power. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things you can say about the roles of the speaker. Clay, Henry Clay was clearly a very strong speaker. And if you look at uh, the period from 1820 uh, to 1860, there was no one person in the United States more responsible for holding our union together than Henry Clay. So he played a big role uh, in our country for, frankly, a very long time. Now, he had other interests. You know, he believed that we had needed a national banking system. And he thought we ought to have a national highway system long before its day. Uh, but uh, uh, clearly quite a leader. You know, my particular situation, uh, I followed uh, Ms. Pelosi, I uh, worked uh, closely with Mr. Hastert, uh, served under Speaker uh, Gingrich and Speaker Foley. So I had, and I had watched this over the years and, and uh, had, a, had my own view of what I thought the Speaker's role should be. And uh, last year, after the election, one of the first opportunities I had to meet with the 87 freshman Republicans uh, who were elected, uh, was a dinner that uh, each of us have held uh, in the old house chamber in the Capitol called Statuary Hall. And it was that night 
uh, in front of these 87 freshmen in the old house chamber uh, when I recall stories about Clay uh, having, having officiated uh, in that room. But in my case, uh, we're shaped by the experience that we've had, in my case, over 20 years before I became there. I'm a big believer in the institution itself. Uh, and, uh, and my big goal is to, is to let this truly be the people's house. Uh, and uh, and I'm not to be critical of those who came before me, uh, but I've got my own ideas about, about having the process work and, and having the institution be strong. Uh, because if we're serious about taking on the big challenges that face our country, uh, you have to have an institution that's strong enough uh, to be able to deal with the big issues that our country faces every day. Leader Pelosi. Thank you very much, John. I want to join our speaker in saying how much uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk about a great speaker of the House, the youngest speaker of the House, Henry Clay. Uh, when I heard of my invitation, it was from my colleague, uh, ben Chandler, who was here. Did you get the letter, he said? Uh, ben Chandler's daughter is starting at Transylvania University in the fall, so that's very exciting. <laughs> he and his wife Jennifer are here with Albert IV. Uh, they brag on this area all the time in the Congress of the United States. Right outside of what used to be the Speaker's office, it was the Speaker's office for Tip O'Neill, it was the Speaker's office for uh, Jim Wright, and, and, and it was, and it is now the speaker's office has moved to another location, but exactly right outside the door of the speaker's office in Statuary Hall, Henry Clay. He's looking very distinguished, very dapper, looking into the distance. And you try to imagine, says statesman leader, what is he, where is he looking? Is he looking to Kentucky? Are his eyes drawn there? Because he certainly drew the eyes of America to Kentucky, the West. The West, they called it, the beauty of the land and the spirit of the people. It's a great, great invigoration for America, Kentucky was. And of course, with his leadership, more people knew about it. Uh, Lincoln called um, uh, Henry Clay his idol. His idol, one of his regrets was that when Henry Clay died, and they took him from, you know the story, I know, but just to reference it, when they took him from Washington to come home to Kentucky after he died, he didn't turn right, left, he turned right, and he went to Baltimore and Philadelphia and New York and Buffalo, he went all over the country and tens of thousands of people would appear wherever he went. And then he came down the, the Lake Erie and the, Ohio River to come home. But hundreds of, you know, thousands and thousands of people were there to honor him. A man who had never been president of the United States, but was the most popular political figure, governmental official in our country. And he felt disappointed because for whatever reason, he couldn't capture this powerful orator, this great speaker. He just couldn't capture it. And he said in his own words, the spell, the long enduring spell with which the souls of men were bound to him is a miracle. Who can compass it? And he did himself compass it years later as the, as the uh, drive for unifying our country and keeping it together that Henry Clay was a champion of some of his very words were the words of that Lincoln who was inspired by and used to keep our country together. So he was a bridge, Henry Clay, from our founders. He served with Madison. He served with Madison was the president, one of the people present at the founding of our country, and then lived, of course, in 1852. But when Madison was president, the presidents, the earlier presidents were and the people were fearful of a strong executive. They did not want a king. For that and other reasons, Henry Clay was able to institute a very strong legislative branch. He, he recognized and said often that Article I of the Constitution was the legislative branch. That gave it supremacy. It gave it supremacy. And, uh, and the, again, the interest of the people in not having too strong an executive enabled him to make the legislature the supreme body among the equal uh, bodies in the balance of 
of power in our country. His idea was, now let me say it very clearly, his syllogism was the speaker, Mr. Speaker, the speaker is the head of the majority party. See how this feels to you. The legislative majority, <laughs> the speaker is the head of the majority party. The legislative majority should shape government. Ergo, the speaker should coordinate and direct government's course. Would you tell the president that? <laughs> He served in the Senate first, as Ambassador Kavanaugh mentioned. And he said that he didn't really like it there because they just talked all the time and never really got that much done. <laughs> so instead of running for Senate or asking the legislature to elect him again, he said he would run for the House. First day he got there, he became Speaker of the House. What a blessing to our country. Thank you for the honor to be here. I think I just heard an argument for the infrastructure bank, but we can get to that later. <laughs> Speaker Hester. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, I want to uh, thank the folks here at Transylvania for hosting us, certainly for the Clay Center, for the great work they do. And uh, it's just an honor, I, I think, to be here to uh, commemorate this great man's uh, anniversary of becoming sworn in as Speaker of the House. I sit here as two other of my colleagues, and we're saddened that several other of our previous colleagues couldn't be here. The history of this country is so different, not saying it's more complex or, or more complicated, but so different. And as time goes on and history changes, uh, it's how you adapt to those differences. And you know, the time that uh, Henry Clay was served in, in, in the uh, US Congress, both as in the Senate and as speaker, was an amazing time in the United States. I mean, the, the Kentucky, we were, this is the frontier. And uh, going back to the Missouri Compromise, the um, Treaty of Ghent that he signed, uh, which takes us back to the War of 1812, he really did have some amazing influences and really did some really great things. Uh, I think of all our colleagues, my colleagues that are here, former colleagues that are here, you know, we all each have a different time and a different challenge that comes before us. And uh, certainly uh, Speaker Pelosi, uh, dealt with uh, health care and some of these great social issues that were before us. Uh, John uh, Boehner, Speaker Boehner, uh, is dealing with some real economic issues, which de depends and determines where this country is going to go for the next not only several years, but certainly decades from now. And I look back at my time and, you know, it was interesting because my first part of my um, speakership, I served two, spe two presidents. And then uh, we were working on education. John was the chairman of the education committee. Uh, we were doing ed educational issues. We were doing highway issues. We were doing health care issues. We were doing all these things that really were domestic. And then something happened. It's called 9-11 and changed the whole complex. And during that first two years uh, under a, a Democrat president, then under a Republican president, we had our partisan battles, and especially in election years, uh, the partisanship seemed to get turned up. The volume was there. But when 9-11 happened, something changed. And I remember being uh, in that room in a quote unquote, an undisclosed location with uh, Senator Daschle, who was the uh, Democrat leader at the time, uh, Citrent Lott, who was Republican leader in the Senate, um, Dick Gebhardt, who was re uh, Democrat leader in the House, and myself as speaker. And we basically looked at each other, and gave each other an oath and say, look at uh, two things. We need to get this country back together again. But during those periods of time, all of the partisanship, not all the partisan, but most of the partisanship fell away. And there were things that we as Republicans probably wouldn't have done in ordinary times. And I know there are things that the Democrats wouldn't have done in ordinary times, but we were able to come together. We were able to find that compromise when the country was at peril, when the country needed it. So I think in the history of this nation, uh, you here in, in Lexington uh, can be honored, the home of Henry Clay, who certainly uh, was the epitome of those, that, that type of behavior, uh, a person who could find compromise in very tough times, so, somebody who could reach across the aisle, to reach across for philosophies, re reach across uh, so many different types of, of, of social strata, even at that time, and make 
things work. And uh, I have been honored to serve with these two distinguished people. Uh, I know they have strive, strived to do that, and uh, it's an honor to be with you tonight. Thank you. Speaker Hastert, I want to kick off the questioning with you because, as you mentioned, you all have different challenges that come before you. Uh, and I know that most members of Congress would rather pull their fingernails out than vote for the debt limit, especially for a president of the other party. Um, and you look at the history and the, the, there's a big partisan flip in how people approach that issue. But Speaker Hastert, he's got a big uh, challenge on his hands this summer. What advice do you have for him? Well, my advice is good luck, but uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 uh, the debt limit is, was always one of the toughest votes. There are three votes that came down that I looked at. Two came on an annual basis. One was the budget, and one was the debt limit. It seemed almost every year that we had to face it. And the budget was uh, an issue of you tried to, to put together the foundation and, and the blueprint for how this country spends its money. And of course, whether you're going to deficit spend or you're going to save money, uh, we were lucky the first uh, three years I was speaker, we pay, were able to pay down $650 billion. And that never had happened before. But that we were in a, a fortunate time to be able to do that. But the decision there was either you're going to spend that money or you're going to save it. And the only way that you can uh, really save that money, there's no bank to put it in, is to pay down debt. And that's what we were. That was a decision that we made. I was thinking as the speaker, uh, my distinguished uh, uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Hastert, the spe former speaker was speaking, that uh, it was reminding me of when uh, Henry Clay was the preeminent legislator and, and uh, Andrew Jackson was the president of the United States and there was a deficit of oh my, it must have been $14 million or something like that, which was a huge amount of money at the time. But every time we had a war, like the War of 1812, or other, uh, uh, there were many downturns in the economy, the, uh, the downturn in 1837, one that preceded that, that was after Johnson, uh, Jackson, but it, it was always a problem, it was always a fight, and they had to find the money. And Henry, Clay went back and forth in his support of a, a national bank. Sometimes he was you know, just depending on uh, the form it took and, and how it would proceed and how regional it would be and whatever. That people shouldn't think we have to raise the debt limit so we can spend more and therefore have to have a higher debt limit. No, we have to honor our debt and we have to make a change so that we don't find ourselves in a, a situation that could be harmful to our economy. It may not be possible to completely succeed, but we have to strive to that place uh, because the American people, uh, this is probably, with stiff competition, mind you, one of the worst votes that, me me that I mean, you think members regard as one of the worst votes that they uh, can take. And it is, uh, it's tough. And I, uh, Speaker has all of my sympathy. <laughs> well, spe speaking of that, do I get any votes? Yeah. Oh, you know you'll get votes from her. The, uh, but I want to ask you from a slightly different angle, and that is, you know, we're, we're here uh, in part under the auspices of the Henry Clay Center for Statesmanship. When you think about a fight like the debt limit, and you are the leader of your party, but you're also the leader of the whole house, what is the concept of statesmanship? How does that inform your decision making? What does it mean? Uh, I think it means seizing the opportunity. You know, for 50 of the last 55 years, our government has spent more than what it has brought in. Uh, there's not an American who doesn't understand that that's just not sustainable. You know, the sooner we deal uh, with the, the entitlement crisis, the easier it will be to make changes necessary to ensure that those programs are around for the long term. And over the course of the last 20 years, uh, you know, I've watched presidents, I've watched people look up at this problem as if they were looking up at a mountain. They'd see how tall it was and how steep it was and kick the can down the road. Well, guess what? We're at a road to kick the can down. And uh, today there are 10,000 of us baby boomers retiring every day. 
10,000. 10,000 more people signed up for Social Security. 10,000 more people signed up for Medicare. And it's not as if there's actually money in the Medicare trust fund or the Social Security trust fund. It's all been spent. And uh, Are you mad at him over that and, Medicare prescription drug program, by the way? And so it's, it's <laughs> we, my point is we have to deal with this. And the sooner we deal with it, the better off we're going to be. Now, I made this point perfectly clear to the president. This is the moment. This is the opportunity. One party would never deal with this problem. Way too much political risk. Uh, but we have an opportunity, because we've got divided government, uh, to stand together and solve the problem. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be interesting what happens here over the next couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to it. Well, now it's, uh, with what's happened on the Hill, with the talks that were going on, this is in the hands of you and the president. Uh, do you personally at this moment, uh, well, not exclusively, but significantly. Well, if he has the votes, that's yeah. a different story. Do you personally have any doubt that by August the 2nd, the debt limit's going to be raised? Oh, I can't say that uh, for sure. Remember, it's more important to deal with a problem uh, than to deal with some arbitrary date. Uh, I don't want the, nobody in the world believes we're going to default on our debt, nor should we default on our debt. So you don't it's want to look on debt. the TV screen and see 700 points down in the Dow like happened after the tarp went down, do you? Nobody in the world believes we're going to default on our debt. It's more important for us to address the underlying problem that is driving us to have to increase the debt limit. Uh, Leader Pelosi, let me ask you a, a variant of the question that I was asking him. And it goes to this concept of statesmanship, where you have to resent, uh, represent interests beyond your personal preference, beyond your party's preference, and do something for the country. How do you go talk to members of your own caucus and say, I know you don't like this, but we have to do it? Well, we did that on the TARP vote, as you know, and uh, the Democrats, by and large, made that vote for President Bush. It was his request, and we acted in a bipartisan way on it. It, again, is in that contest for the worst possible, most unpopular vote you can name. But we had to do it. We had to do it. it was, we were the, uh, on the brink of a financial crisis of global magnitude. We had to pull it back. Uh, but I, I would say that uh, to your issue of statesmanship, I think that we have uh, an opportunity as we as this the focus is on this uh, debt limit issue uh, to talk to the American people about what our values are. If our values are to have a dignified retirement for our seniors, the education of our children, uh, the creation of jobs. Uh, to keep an innovation, to keep America number one, to do so in a way that reduces the deficit, that reduces the deficit, have to make tough decisions, uh, but not to cut our seed corn and, and to uh, curb our, our uh, uh, economic growth, then if we agree on the high ground of these values, then we can make decisions in the budget that correspond to that. How do you come to common ground if his members actually believe that cutting spending right now will achieve that, and your members think the exact opposite, and that's crazy. It's, just, it's simply, with all due respect, simply not true. Uh, we all know that we have to cut. We believe that revenue should be on the table, and as the, lead, as the speaker Haster said, you have to have growth. You have to have growth to bring money into the account, into the, uh, to the uh, treasury, but into the economy and into the treasury. Uh, so it's not a question of whether we have to cut. There's no question. But, uh, but it, I, I will not have it be characterized that we don't know that there has to be cuts. I also think that there should be uh, revenue on the table. And I don't want to go in because we're having a nice civil <laughs> conversation here right now in the honor of the great <laughs> compromiser, in honor of the great compromiser who found a way, who always found a way and really wasn't a credit taker. <laughs> let, let me sh uh, shift gears for a second and talk about something that you alluded to in your opening remarks. Um, and it was about what happened after 9-11. Uh, the change in tone uh, on the Hill and how members related to one another. Uh, I think that was felt widely across the country. But I had a little different 
uh, at least my memory is a little bit different than yours in the sense that I'm surprised by how short that was. Not, not it was profound for a brief period of time, and then it, it seemed to go away pretty quickly. Um, is, is a horrendous crisis the only way that that spirit can uh, be brought to the surface? Well, I would hope not, but in this case, it did bring that type of spirit. And you know, it lasted about nine months, then we were in a national election, and it, it got back into partisan politics, and it's the mother uh, of what our de democracy is based on, and uh, that debate goes on. But, you know, we had to get, it, interesting, after that time, you know, <clears throat> we had to get the stock market opened again. I mean, that blast was just uh, blocks away. The AT&T building, the communications was knock were knocked out. Uh, the Washington uh, Wall Street Journal, whether you liked it or not, was almost out of, was out of business for a while. They were, you know, right there at, at, at that face. You know, <clears throat> we couldn't uh, we couldn't repair a building unless we passed something called terrorism insurance. Uh, and we knew that there were cells. Uh, uh, leader Pelosi was a uh, leader on on the Int intelligence committee at the time. We knew that there were cells in this country, and they were planning to do bad things, we had to stop them. And so, you know, we passed something called the Patriot Act. And, uh, you know, Democrats didn't like it, some Republicans didn't like it, but everybody put together their best effort to get it done. So, and I think you guys are still passing the Patriot Act forward because it, 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 it was something that uh, infringed some rights, but for the greater good. I mean, it was something that nobody wanted to do, but we had to do it. Well, and, so it was, it, it, there was a big change in the moment. Was there any lasting change or are we now in the same place, or even given the nature of the media and the way uh, politics works these days, is it worse now in terms of incivility than it was before then? Look, at, uh, you know, we've come into the age, just like Henry Clay had to deal with different changes, we've changed. You know, when I first came to the House of Representatives, you know, we had teller votes on the floor. Everybody was on the floor. They were on the floor for hours. When I was in the legislature, you spent your whole day on the floor. So you really got to know other members. You got to know people on the other side of the aisle quite well. Now, we go back to 1994. There was one cable, uh, one cable station that just did news. Uh, there, was, uh, there was an internet, but only a couple of geeks in Palo Alto were using it. <laughs> right? There were no blogs, there was no Facebook, no MySpace, none of this existed. No and Twitter. You, and when, no Twitter. And when you look at all of the information that's being thrown at the American people today, uh, what's, what's, what it's tending to do is driving people into one of two camps. Uh, and members of Congress reflect their constituents. It's as clear to, I think, all of us as uh, we, we're there, we work with these members. And yes, uh, there are things that have happened in the institution uh, where members don't get to know each other as well. Uh, but, uh, but still, at the end of the day, uh, I think uh, what's happening in the media world, uh, what's happening with digital media, uh, and then what's happening with these outside interest groups and the tremendous amounts of money they have, uh, it's, it's causing further divides. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, our jobs uh, at various stages have been to run the institution. And uh, one of my goals, as I try to restore the institution as I see it, is uh, to really get the committee system functioning, get members working together. Uh, I'm a big believer that more bills ought to come to the floor under a more open process where more people get to participate, more people get to offer amendments. And the result of Don't this- Don't you guys always say that, but then the other party says it doesn't really happen, it's not well, open, it's uh, not- the facts will, uh, you'll see. Uh, I've been at it, I've been at it all year, and I'm gonna stay at it. Uh, I, and I take grief from my committee chairman, I take grief from my majority, uh, because why are you allowing them to offer all those rotten amendments? And making us take those tough votes. Uh, I told them, just get used to it. Uh, but uh, members will figure out sooner or later if they wanna get a bill across the floor, they're gonna have to build a coalition. They're gonna have to find somebody on the other side of the aisle to work with. And I think over time, uh, that'll help reduce some of the scar tissue uh, that, uh, that I think we see in the House today. When I was growing up in Washington in the 1960s and 70s, and my dad was involved in covering politics, my neighbors included uh, the kids of a lot of members of Congress who lived in Washington. They didn't stay back in the district. So Ted Stevens' kid was a good friend of mine. 
George McGovern's kids went to high school with me. It was all over the map. Now members tend to stay in their districts. I, when I was doing a book a couple of years ago, I talked to one of your colleagues, Jim McCreary, and he was saying that for years he was living in Louisiana, commuting to the Congress. Then he finally moved to Washington, and he became, his kid got on a soccer team with Chet Edwards uh, of Texas. He said, for several election cycles, when I was living in Louisiana, uh, I was raising money to defeat Chet Edwards. But all of a sudden, I'm standing on the soccer field with him, our kids are playing, I'm like, I'm not raising money to beat this kid's dad. Uh, how, how important is that? I think it has had an impact uh, on the Congress and, and how we get along and how we get to know each other. Uh, but, uh, you know, I never considered moving my family to Washington. My kids uh, uh, were 10 and 12. Uh, the last thing they want to do was to pick up and move to Washington. And in my case, you know, I, it's just an hour flight, Washington, Cincinnati, so uh, never thought about it. Uh, but it has had some impact, no question. Uh, if I just may pick up on some of what the speaker has said, when he talked about the uh, fact there were three networks, CNN was brand new when he came to Congress, getting back to Henry Clay. When he was Speaker of the House, a message could travel as fast as a horse could gallop and a ship could, or a ship could sail. So it took that long for word to reach the public. When we came to Congress, there were three networks uh, and, uh, becoming uh, uh, CNN, and now people have 500, 600 channels on TV, and they, can, they have choice there, and they have a choice to abandon it all and go to some of the new med media uh, that the speaker referenced. Word goes out, somebody's version of the story goes out on things. So it, it takes a uh, you know, it, it's a challenge to us as to how, how to uh, make sure that whatever it is you're trying to convey to the American people is conveyed in a way that shows that either the uh, agreement or the disagreement. So um, uh, whether you live in Washington or not, Henry Clay, they live there all the time. Think of, I uh, talked about communication. Think about transportation. No wonder he wanted internal improvements and in roads and the rest because it took a while to go from Washington to Kentucky and back. It's not like getting on a plane for an hour, or even five hours from California. It was a whole different undertaking if somebody in the family was sick or this or that. So how you uh, attend it to your family responsibilities as well as your national responsibilities as well as meeting the needs of your constituents uh, was quite a challenge, but almost everybody lived in Washington. But then, as now, people had their differences. They had duels. No, people came, they were passionate about what they believed in. And they were uh, gentlemen and the they- The duels might make some of the arguments shorter. <laughs> I mean, one man, one member caned another member to death on the floor of the house, for goodness sakes. <laughs> so, you know, I think that, uh, that um, when, you, when we're being the giant kaleidoscope and things are getting done and things are moving along, that's not news. What's news is when you don't get along, and that's usually all that people see. And what also they see is how campaigns are conducted, and they think, oh my gosh. Uh, and, if, uh, and if that's their first picture of government, uh, then it's, um, it's not a pretty sight, and maybe it won't attract them to it. But that's why I always say the most wholesome change in politics and government has been the increased participation of women in the political process. <laughs> last, night, last night, the speaker and I were at the baseball game, the women's softball game, and the Democratic and Republican women were one team. They played the media and the Democrats and Republicans won. <laughs> we never win when it comes to the media. <laughs> the, um, Speaker Hastert, let me ask you about a, um, uh, the different ways that different people approach the job. Uh, uh, speaker Boehner talked about how Henry Clay was the first powerful speaker, and it is a command institution. It has, there's a lot of power invested in the majority to do uh, to get done what you want. But within that, there are different styles. I was talking to uh, uh, Steve Elmendorf, a veteran uh, aide on Capitol Hill. All of you guys know him. He said, you've got your top-down speakers and your bottom-up speakers. 
and Gingrich, Pelosi, Wright, top-down speakers. Clay. Clay, <laughs> top-down speakers. And then you got your bottom-up speakers. Uh, you, Speaker Boehner now, uh, with a different style. Talk a little bit about the choice that you make in how you're going to execute the job. Well, I think we all learn from our predecessors, and I hope these folks here learn from their predecessors. But anyway, <laughs> um, good and bad. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I always had a coaching philosophy that uh, if the coach was in the headlines every day, the team was in trouble. If the team's in the headlines every day, the team's doing pretty good. And I, I think that ap applies to the House of Representatives. And, and what I tried to do is to make sure we call it regular order, to make sure that your bills started in your subcommittee, that people testified in committee, that you had people go through the amendment process, that bills would come to the floor and have a, a fairly open process, and uh, things would happen. Now, you tried to do that all the time, and uh, Leader Pelosi will tell you it didn't happen all the time, but you tried. Mm -hmm. And there, that was the goal. And I, I, my view is, 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 is you build a, a better esprit de corps, you give more people the opportunity to participate, and in the end, you have a better product. How well, that you, how score, I, 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 it's interesting to me that uh, you view me as a, a top down. Uh, I think that it's important to note that the reason we were successful in passing uh, our legislation was is because it was bottom up. Uh, we have a, the most diverse caucus. It's diverse in every possible way. Of course, all of us are diverse geographically, but it's diverse philosophically, it's diverse gender, -wide, very large uh, uh, women, very large women's caucus, very large black caucus, an Hispanic caucus, um, openly gay, lesbian members of, very diverse in terms of who the people are, who they represent, and uh, philosophically, generationally, in every way, it's, it's, you go in there and it's a beautiful sight because it looks like America. And I always say the beauty is in the mix. Now you have all these different fibers of different shades and different hues and you have to build a very strong fabric, a piece of legislation which will become hopefully public policy which will improve the lives of the American people. We didn't get the bills because we went in top down and said, this is what it is, now we're all going to vote for it. It was a consensus, a consensus uh, that we have, and nothing makes me prouder even now in the minority than to see my members on the floor take to the floor and talk about why they have a certain position uh, on a bill or legislation and the work, that, and that all comes uh, from the committees. It wasn't a bill that any one of us would have written. Perhaps that's the way it was. Uh, for Henry Clay, I, you know, I, I'm sure he, he had to build uh, uh, collaborations, but we certainly do. Every time we start, we start with one vote, and how do you get to 218 from there, uh, putting uh, the legislation together? How does it work in Kentucky? How does it work in, in different parts of the country? It's it just, uh, uh, we have a national responsibility while, uh, while I say to the members, your job, title, and your job description are one and the same. Representative, You're an independent representative of your people. And your thinking is what we want here. We don't want a rubber stamp, we want the individual thinking that you bring. And, and that's how we get to where we are. Uh, while you know, it may be characterized as top down, it's top down only in orchestration but not in developing the legislation. So set aside the, the ideological differences that you have and the partisan differences. What did you learn from her leadership style in choosing yours? Well, as I said before, we learn from those who, who come before us. I've been there 20 years. I've served under half a dozen speakers. Uh, and I said that before, but there's another issue. We, each of us has our own personality. Uh, we have our own experience during those 20 years of uh, of being legislators. You know, in my case, uh, I've got 11 brothers and sisters. I learned, uh, I learned the issue of consensus early on. <laughs> and whether it was running my business or running my office uh, or what I'm doing today, uh, I tend to be a, uh, one who tries to develop consensus. Uh, my parents uh, were the most patient people uh, that God put on earth, and I've got an overabundance of that patience. <laughs> and so uh, I, I don't... 
I'm, I'm a big believer that we can talk about it, we can talk about it, let's figure out where the consensus is, and then begin to move. So you and the President are going to get consensus on spending cuts plus revenues? <laughs> we'll see. The one thing that we, I think, all agree on is our first responsibility is to keep the American people safe. We take the oath, protect and defend, spiritually and literally, to defend, keep them safe. Because if people aren't safe and the country is not secure, really nothing else matters. And that's probably where we have, as, as Speaker Hastert said, uh, following 9-11, of course, that uh, highlighted that priority for us. Uh, but that is a place where um, I think the defense bill will have strong consensus and, and uh, coming together. There'll be disagreements on some subjects like Afghanistan and Libya and the rest, but not on the fact that our men and women in uniform uh, deserve our support. Our veterans, when they come home, deserve our support. And that is a, a, a a bond that we have with them that is, uh, that is a sacred one has been since the beginning of our country. But, yes. but I think that is one place where members do come together on their committees and the rest where there isn't as much disagreement. I mean, they might be on a subject like Afghanistan or something, but I'm talking about the broader right. issue of the defense of our country. Mr. Speaker, one thing you did which surprised some people, impressed some people, was you could have stopped a particular jet engine project that benefited your state and district and did not. What went into your thinking about the, that? The House voted to end the, the second engine for the F-35. Uh, we went uh, into a negotiation with the president. Um, they tried to put it on the table and give it to me. And uh, I, was not that, I was not going to defy the will of the people for the benefit of my own constituents. Now, I've never done an earmark in the 20 years that I've been there. It's just not something I believe in. I, I know I'm opening up a can of worms here. Uh, but I, I don't believe in earmarks. I've never done them. And, uh, and I certainly wasn't going uh, to take uh, $500 million and put it in my district uh, just because I could and defy the will of the vote of the House. What are you going to do? Let, let me ask you, uh, all of you, really, about how you approach the question of how far you push it and I mean push it, I mean the, author the power of the office, the ability to use the rules to achieve what you think is necessary to achieve for the country, politically, whatever. I'm thinking of to the Medicare prescription drug vote, which is now controversial in your party. A lot of members, uh, a lot of his members now think that was a mistake. Um, that vote was held open a long time. People complained that it was in a an outrage that it went on a long time and people were lobbied on the floor and the votes were there to defeat it, but it passed anyway. Uh, speaker Pelosi, or Leader Pelosi, when you were Speaker, there was some parliamentary razzle-dazzle on the uh, health care bill to finally get that through after Massachusetts. What razzle-dazzle? Oh, I'm thinking about the reconciliation process. Well, no, that was the process. Reconciliation, that was the process under which we operated. That was nothing in common with the... I mean, I mean, really, let, let's not... Well, let's get you both talking about yeah. it. Did, no, I mean, well, we, we, could have, we could have done the, the Medicare bill in, in reconciliation, too. Could have. Yeah, but we brought have. it out and went through a process. Matter of fact, we passed it uh, three different times before it actually ever became law. And so it was something that took a, a matter of years. The issue here was, look, in Medicare, you could, uh, if somebody had... Uh, 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 heart disease, uh, you could put them in the hospital and put a stent in or open heart surgery, but you couldn't give them the medicine that would keep them from being in the hospital. Or if you had uh, uh, a disease where you had to get renal dialysis or uh, have a leg op amputated, you know, you could do that, huge cost in the hospital, but you couldn't pay for the insulin or the glucophage that kept people healthy. It was, a, it was an economic decision. And in the long term, you know, people said, well, this is going to cost $400 billion more. It costs $350 billion less. So I, I did pay. Uh, but but you know, that, was a decision, that was a decision that you had to make 
whether you were doing the right thing or you're doing the wrong thing. And if you're doing the right thing, you, you had to believe in it and move it forward. And uh, we knew it was the right thing to do in our mind, and uh, we're going to move forward and, and do it. Leader Pelosi, do you have any problems with how they executed that vote? Well, I, I think they kept the vote open extraordinarily, uh, an extraordinarily long time, hours and hours and hours. So the president went to sleep and got up, and then, you know, hours later. And uh, that's just really not the way. But you know what? I, I don't know how... Uh, um, uh, that John F. Kennedy was when a young co uh, senator, he, um, uh, well, we all know as a congressman, they voted the, uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway and all of that, which was a national interest, not, not in the interest the people in Boston thought of opening another seaway. But anyway, and that's profiles encourage, he, he was one of them. But in any event, when he was a young senator, he was made the head of a committee to name the five greatest senators of all time and one of them was Henry Clay. Uh, but it was interesting that, uh, because people usually are naming people they know or nearby or whatever it is, but that Henry Clay was one of the first ones that they named, and they have a special place on the Senate side where his picture is as one of the greatest. Now that you've sat... And they were, they were not of the same party. Now that you've sat where she sat and know what you need to do and the pressures of that office, do you have any problem with how they did the end game on health care in terms of the, the role of the speaker? You have power, uh, but I think, uh, as I've said to Ms. Pelosi when I gave her the gavel, I said it when, uh, when she gave me the gavel. Uh, uh, the, the power of the majority uh, lies in the fact that you have limited power that you can do great things with. Uh, and, uh, and there is a lot of power. It has to be used judiciously. And uh, uh, we've, every, everyone who's ever had this job has had to make some very difficult decisions about how far to push the institution, how far to squeeze the process uh, in, in order to, to get to an outcome. Now, you can probably guess I'd, I'd be a little critical of, of, of how that bill became law. Uh, the fact is, it became law. Not my style. That's just not, uh, in the long run, uh, I think listening to the American people, following the will of, of the American people is, is critically important in allowing the institution the openness and the flexibility to reflect, truly reflect that will is, in, is, is what's in the long-term best interest of our country. But which part do you refer to when you say, not my style? I, I don't think I would have squeezed the process that way. Well, if I just met it, because we listened to this distinguished, longest-serving Republican speaker in the history of America talk about the, his view of the uh, Medicare prescription drug bill, which in my view gave away the store to the pharmaceutical industry. But since you are putting me on the spot in the barrel right now, let me just say this. We were determined in our party to make health care a right, not a privilege for the few in our country, and that it stands there with Social Security, and Medicare, and health care. So that's what we believe, and then we did the legislation. Now, you might not know it from the conversation, but there are nearly 200 Republican amendments that were made part of that legislation. This went through three major committees in the House uh, to become of uh, the bill that it is. And the president at the end took us all to Blair House and said, give me your ideas. What can we do to incorporate them here to, because I, I agree with the speaker in this respect, to the extent, as I said before about the debt ceiling, to the extent that you can have as much bipartisanship as possible, that's what you would strive for. But not if you're gonna dilute it so they have nothing at the end of the day. So that's where your calibration is. We came here to do a job. We didn't come here to make nice-nice with each other, but if we can make nice-nice and do the job, that's a good thing, too. Now, let me express some sympathy, or that's not quite the word for my <laughs> distinguished speaker. The advantage that I had is I know my members. I've known them for a long time, been there 20 year, 24 years now, but I've seen them come in and then as leader first under uh, President Bush and, and then speaker under President Bush and then under... Um, um, President Obama, uh, I, I helped elect those people to take us to the majority. So I knew them 
really well because the number grew over a period of time. This speaker, and he, he obviously can speak for himself, but looking on at him, he got 83, was it 83? 87. 87 new members in one day. Now, he's a pretty amiable fellow, but it's really hard to know the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations, the motivation, the background, and all the rest, the family, the this, the that, of 80-some people right off the bat. It doesn't mean you didn't know a lot of them, but that's a big chunk at a time to then have to, say, orchestrate to build the coalitions that you're talking about. So if I had any, uh, shall we say, um, as sympathy, is that empathy. the right word? Empathy. 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 I think, I think good I for him. Good for him. <laughs> we, we are, um, I appreciate it. <laughs> we are, we're running a little short on time. Uh, I, I did want to get to, um, uh, to one suggestion that your former aide, John Fury, had for me, which was, um, so you, you, you want to unite the members on the stage. Uh, ask him about whether or not, in fact, the real institutional problem in Washington is not about the Speaker's office, not about the House, it's about the Senate. So <laughs> let, me, let me just invite you to, to make an observation or two about the Senate, and please don't use any profanity. You remember, when you're the Speaker, you, you represent your own party. You are the leader of your party. You have to bang through the, the issues and, and the philosophies that you members have. But the other, you're also the Speaker of the whole House. And so one of the things that you know owe everybody is fairness. Some people have bigger margins. It's easier, in some cases, tougher when you have bigger margins. Because, because the, the reaction, right. and, and I can say this as an observer, I'm not in that parlay anymore, but the, the, the 87 members that John had, a lot of those people were elected because of anger about what happened. I mean, seriously, it was a reaction. And but so, but, 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 yeah. but those people are, uh, in a sense, have their feet in, 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 in stuck in a, in firmly in the ground, and they don't want to compromise very much. But the enemy is the, is the Senate, <laughs> because constantly you pass legislation and they don't look at it, they just pass it over, or they don't have time to do it. And it becomes very frustrating for leadership and members, yeah. but they are the Senate. I don't believe you Mr. Said Speaker, that. I'm going to close uh, with one question for you. Uh, set aside the legislation the economy, philosophy, the institution. Henry Clay has a legacy in Washington. He introduced the mint julep to Washington, D.C., the Willard Hotel. So when we're 200 years from now, what are they going to talk about what Speaker Boehner did to Washington, D.C.? They'll know a couple hundred years from now. <laughs> I have to say that when I became speaker with all of our agenda that we went forth, when I said no more smoking in the Capitol, that got more news than anything, especially because Mr. Boehner uh, has, has sort of has a tendency. They produce tobacco that... here. Tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> I still say no more you, you know she was doing it for your own good. <laughs> <laughs> we were able to work this out together. That we were. Well, we have an amiable relationship, as I did with Speaker Hastert, on many of the, shall we say, housekeeping aspects. But uh, let me say this in, uh, as we leave. Uh, Henry Clay was committed to education. How proud he would be to see Transylvania uh, University thriving uh, uh, the way it is 200 years later. Um, And Owen Williams, thank you for your hospitality. To President Owen Williams for your hospitality and to all of you. But he, I think he sometimes, uh, uh, Speaker Henry Clay, didn't think he had as much education as he would have liked, formal education. Of course, he, he learned so much afterward. Wanted his children to have more, but wanted all children to have more. And for geez, most of his life, he was a trustee here and for a what, 25% of the life of this institution so far, 20%, he was a trustee. So we know how precious it was to him. It's quite an honor uh, to be here with all of you. Could all of so you join you. me in thanking our guests, 50% of the living speakers of the House?
role of the Speaker of the House, a tribute to Henry Clay, is available on DVD. To order, please call 859-233-8120 or visit transy.edu. The role of the Speaker of the House, a tribute to Henry Clay, is brought to you by White Clay, helping banks deliver more for their clients. The Henry Clay Center for Statesmanship, educating a new generation of leaders in the principles and practices of statesmanship, diplomacy, and conflict resolution. Learn more at henryclaycs.org. The Kentucky Humanities Council, whose Kentucky Chautauqua presentations are telling Kentucky's stories everywhere in the Commonwealth. Kentucky Chautauqua, the impact is dramatic. G.F. Vaughn Tobacco Company, a Kentucky tradition for 100 years. Lexington Furniture at the corner of Manowar and Palumbo in Lexington. It's so much you'll love to live with. And by Lexington Oriental Rugs, handmade elegance made affordable for everyone.